Uh, well, so I'm going to go back in time a little bit. As a father, Tim Hatton spent years piecing together what went wrong in his daughter's life. So Michaela Ann Hatton, she's just over 30, um, beautiful kid growing up. As a young girl, Michaela found her stride in an Oregon City horse arena. We were really close. After high school, she met a guy. Everything changed. She, like I said, had a, basically ostracized herself from everybody in the family. Michaela ended up on the streets of Portland in a tent addicted to drugs. Rarely could Tim find her. Uh, it was March of the following year in 2022. I got the phone call from my, from my ex. And she said, she's OD'd. It was fentanyl. I can't believe this happened to my kid kind of situation. Mm-hmm. Like... You know, you take this kid home when they're born, and you never expect anything like that. And, um... She survived. So they started looking for residential treatment. No beds were immediately available. It was heart-wrenching to feel like you've been that close to something. And this may be my chance to help her. Michaela went back to the streets. Here she is this past spring, still addicted to fentanyl and in the hospital again, but this time to give birth. A few months later, she finally got into treatment. She made it three days. And back on the street. Jade. I'm back with some food. Like Tim, Shannon Starr's daughter also lives on the streets of Portland addicted to fentanyl. She's 29-year-old Jade. We spent a day with her this past winter. For me, it's just like, I'm just not ready to like already sober up because I've already been there. I really feel stuck in a rut. Um, I don't feel like this is the lowest point. But as her mother, and I've known her her entire life, she needs help. I need to get her the help, and I don't have the resources, and if the city's not helping me with those resources, then I'm just allowing my daughter to die on the streets of Portland. As these parents fought the streets of Portland, in Salem, lawmakers were making changes to Oregon drug laws. Possession of substances like fentanyl will soon be a crime again, and if caught by police, people will have the option of treatment over jail time. However, they're not required to enroll in that treatment as it stands right now. That's her probably about 14. It's not the change these parents were hoping for. If they catch her, and they're not going to actually require her to get into diversion or deflect, what they call it deflection, right? Going, going into another program. She's not going to get clean. It's kind of like this hands-off approach where it's like, okay, we will kind of give a solution, but we're not going to enforce it. It's useless. It's nothing. It's, it's, it's a big zero. So there's no help. There is one thing they say would help make it mandatory. So the only way somebody like my daughter is going to get better is to be forced to get better. It's sad that I have no help to help my adult child. Until they start actually really treating these people like my daughter, things are not going to get better. She's already hit rock bottom and that didn't do it. If If she dies on the streets of Portland, I don't want to have anything to do with this city or state. Blair joins me now. Holy smokes. I mean, pretty clear that the parents think mandatory treatment is the way to go. Right. They are confident that allowing their children to choose is not the way to go. They want to see that if they're caught with hard drugs, that uh, treatment is mandatory, and they want to see the county enforce that. Yeah, and very heartfelt as well. Tell us about the deflection building. How's that coming along? So it's a work in progress. It's currently under construction in Portland's central east side. The county just hired a Baltimore-based treatment provider to run it. Now, this is all being done in a phased approach. As you can see from this graphic shared with county commissioners today, they're preparing for phase one in September, which is sort of basic and just getting their feet under them in this whole process. A place officers can take people they catch with drugs who choose treatment instead of jail to get connected 
connected to services. Phase two has some sobering services and medications added next spring. And then the final phase three will come in 2026. And that's sort of everything combined and running out of one place. So come September, again, it'll just be a place that officers can take people who choose treatment over jail to get screened and connected to those services. But again, those services, they're not required to enroll in those services. But today, uh, Multnomah County Chair Jessica Vega-Peterson gave her definition of success in that first phase of deflection. Here's what she had to say. When we talk about phase one in September 1st, success is a screening, referral, and to be determined engagement requirement for somebody who has been, who has volunteered, um, fun to voluntarily um, started participating in deflection. And the, the considerations that we have as we're, as we're having this conversation is the public safety needs, the impacts of fentanyl, the existing gaps in our treatment system. Um, but this is something we are all committed to having a definition, you know, an agreed definition of um, the success, that um, engagement requirement. Um, and that's something that we're working on. Seems a little fuzzy still at this point mm -hmm. and just over a month ago. So what about that question of how many times somebody can choose deflection over jail? Right. That has caused some controversy and what we know so far at Washington County, they're doing one per year. Clackamas County has not decided on a limit. They just told us there will be a limit and that goes the same here in Multnomah County. We've learned there will be a limit. They're still deciding on what number that will be. Also want to point out that this option of treatment over jail time is only for people who are caught with possession. If they have have outstanding warrants, they're going straight to jail. And I'll tell you from uh, reporting on the streets, it is pretty hard to find someone using hard drugs that don't have outstanding warrants. Even the parents that we just heard from, they say their children all have outstanding warrants. Wow. Multnomah County Commissioner uh, Sharon Myron today said people who do qualify for deflection still should face consequences. So our opportunity here is not about you know, criminalizing and punishing drug use versus compassion. That's not the dichotomy here. It's about leveraging the threat of negative consequences to achieve positive results. That is compassion because the longer people choose not to get treatment, the more at risk they are of dying, of being raped, of being injured, of getting horrific infections and losing limbs, of losing their families, et cetera, before they get on the path to recovery. So how can we leverage this to get people on a better path? Today we got to look at the steps that people will follow as they go through this deflection program. Can you kind of outline it for us? Yeah, so it's the first time that we're seeing this. This diagram basically shows what happens after someone gets dropped off at the deflection center. So basically up here, this line, if someone agrees to treatment or detox and there are available openings, great, they get transported to that center. If someone agrees and there are no current openings, which we know happens quite often, it's up to a peer support specialist to try and connect them with any upcoming available openings. It's unclear where they go from there and the peer support specialist has to follow up with that person but most likely they'll end up back on the streets from the looks of this diagram. Mm, so still some holes or gaps in that piece. Yeah very much so. Okay thanks Blair. Fascinating stuff as always. So now it's your turn. What do you think about how Multnomah County's deflection program is taking shape? Thoughts? Criticisms? Email them to us, will you? The address is thestory at kgw.com. Or if you'd prefer, you can call and leave a voicemail. The number is 503-226-5090.